there's a lot at stake with centering our life in Christ. Like there's a lot that hangs on centering our lives in Jesus. One of those is our witness to the world. As Christians, we're called to to bear witness to Jesus and his kingdom to the world that's watching. And if we're centered in Christ, then we're reflecting him to the world. If we're centered on something else or we're caught up in the chaos of division, what we're reflecting to the world is is not Jesus. And, And it might be something contrary to who he is. Another thing that hangs on being centered is our influence in the world, right? That stamp that we leave on the communities that we live in. And I recognize that for most all of us, if not all of us, that stamp isn't huge. It's it's small, but it's significant. And that mark we need to leave on our community and the people that we know uh, happens when we're centering ourselves in Jesus and his good news and letting him change us. When we're again caught up in chaos and division, that stamp we leave on the community may be something that doesn't reflect the kingdom at all. And so it's important that we stay centered. The one we're gonna look at this morning is also important, supremely important, and it's worship. Uh, and when I say worship, I'm not referring to just the music that we just sang to the Lord or even what we're doing in this room for 70 minutes, not what you necessarily do just personally, uh, maybe as you're driving in the car praying or singing. Worship in the scriptures is this word that captures like an entire whole life, full embodied response to God as our creator and our redeemer. Worship is when we live in grateful, thankful response to him, offering ourselves up to God daily in thanks. That's, that's what worship is. And when we're living in divided times and there's chaos and we're not sure how to stay centered, it's possible that the division can erode worship not just our corporate worship, but it can erode our own personal worship in a way that sometimes we're not even aware of. So I wanna suggest this, this is point one, and it requires a lot of explanation on the back end, which we'll do. But I wanna suggest this, that it is possible that your worship, our worship, isn't as pleasing to God as you think it is, and politics is to blame for it. Um, I'll say it one more time. Hopefully it's not too offensive to some of us. It's possible that your worship, our worship, isn't as pleasing to God as you think it is, and politics is partly to blame for it. Now again, a lot, lot needs to be said, and we will, and I hope you'll hang with me. Also, politics isn't the only thing dividing the world or dividing our nation or our communities right now. There's a lot of other things, but I think it's fair to say that the political world we're living in right now might be causing the most heat in division. I don't know if you agree with that or not, but it's hot. And it's one of those things that we need to be able to talk about as Christians and let the word of God come to bear. Um, I said this first service, if you know me, I hope I don't have to say this, but if you're new, I want to reiterate this so you know. I'm not standing up here as a partisan politician. I don't think my job is to tell you who to vote for or how to vote. Uh, My job as a pastor is to hope convince you, hope convince, or hopefully convince you that Jesus is king as we just sang, and that his kingdom is worth your allegiance and your life and to help you prioritize that above all else. But to do that well, we have to be able to talk about what it looks like to do that living in the current situation that we live in. So I'm not gonna tell you who to vote for, but we are gonna talk a little bit about politics today. Politics are not evil. Governments uh, as itself, the structure is not evil. God instituted it. But government and politics can become context for a lot of evil, And not just because politicians are sinful humans, but because we who participate in a political arena also can be inclined to use politics in evil ways. And sometimes it's in ways that we don't even aren't aware of in our own life. And maybe for you this morning, politics is not your thing and that's okay. And you're thinking to yourself, hey, I'm really detached from politics. I'm a little annoyed you're talking about it. That's not my thing. I don't feel angry or despondent about it. I'm just not really interested. And that's okay. I would just encourage you as we're talking this morning to insert whatever it is in your life that's causing attitudes, actions, and beliefs that might not be in line with Christ and just insert that into politics as we're talking about it. Because there's, for all of us, there's something or some things in our life that's causing us to both think and to live and maybe even to believe certain things uh, that do not align with Jesus and do affect the worship that we offer God. And so wherever you're at this morning, I hope there's something for you to to grab here from Romans chapter 12. But it's not just about attitudes and behaviors. It's also about the belief that's, the beliefs that sit behind attitudes and actions. The things that we believe about people and the things we believe about God. You know, oftentimes we think that we have captured the whole heart of God in our own beliefs about people and the world. Whereas it's possible 
that we might be only capturing a fraction of who he is. And we need to know what is God's whole heart. And, and this is one of the, and we need to be renewed every day in the knowledge of who God is. And then re-re-renewed again and again and again every single day so that we become more and more like the Father and his Son and the Holy Spirit working in us. Now, politics, again, to bring it up, has this way about it among us Christians that it can kind of create tunnel vision, um, which is just a way of saying we might be seeing something to the exclusion of other things. Uh, Because no one political party perfectly captures God's heart. Political parties, no matter what side it is, tends to latch on to one or a few things, some of which might capture God's heart, and then stand against other things that might actually reflect God's heart. And sometimes they have to be against something because the opposing party is for it, and rather than agreeing on it, it's just easier to say they're wrong. And so it creates tunnel vision, and sometimes Christians don't know what to do. Like, where do I fit? Like, I agree with some of that, but not all of it. And sometimes you might be led to say, like, I'm just going to go all in on this thing because I want to belong. I I don't want to be a part of that group over here. And so you become a Christian that might partly reflect God, but you might inadvertently stand against something that God actually loves and cares about. Um, one One of the phrases that's used for this is package deal ethics which is the idea that uh, it's not just politicians either. It's just the way that we think about our lives and groups of people. Like you're you're either all in or you're not. You can't say, yeah, I like those things, like a buffet. I don't like that. People inside the group say, no, you you gotta gotta accept all of it or you gotta go join someone else. And you've probably experienced that before. Maybe, Maybe it's in politics where you're sharing your view with someone that's pretty similar and yet you disagree on one thing and they're like, well, are you with us or are you not? You know, that's kind of the place that we're in. Tim Keller says this, the emphasis on package deals puts pressure on Christians in politics. For example, following both the Bible and the early church, Christians should be committed to racial justice and the poor, but also to understanding that sex is only for marriage and for nurturing family. One of those views seems liberal and the other looks oppressively conservative. The historical Christian, historical Christian position on social issues do not fit into the contemporary political alignments. So in this moment of political division, it's possible that we're being pulled either way to grab onto some things that reflect God's heart and against things that God loves and not capturing his whole heart. If you were here a few weeks ago, Dr. Gary Brashears from Western Seminary came and um, talked about unity and he shared a list of five things that he read from Keller and Larry Hurtado. I'll put up again. Uh, that just Again, just kind of demonstrates what this is like as a Christian. So number one, um, the early church in the New Testament is committed to multiracial, multi-ethnic church. If you read the book of Acts, the gospel is all about going to the ends of the earth, to every nation, tribe, and tongue, every skin color, every kind of person. The church is beautiful when it looks like that because that's what heaven looks like. Number two, commit, highly committed to caring for the poor and the marginalized. Jesus talks about that all over in the Sermon on the Mount to do righteousness, to pray, to give to the poor, to love your enemies, to love those who don't have much. Three, strongly and practically against abortion and infanticide in every way. Number four, sex is for those committed in a marriage covenant. Five, non-retaliatory marked by a commitment to forgiveness. Like that's kind of the mark of early Christians and their commitments in the world. And I think Gary did this, I watched online, He went through each five and asked you, is this more left or more right? So we'll do it again. Number one, is that left or right politically, multiracial, multiethnic? Left. Number two, highly committed to caring for the poor and marginalized. Left. Strongly and practically against abortion and infanticide. Right. Sex is for those committed in a marriage covenant. Non-retaliatory marked by a commitment to forgiveness. None. Yeah, there you go. Yet all five of these, I I get that there's nuance under each one of these and you can parse it out a little differently. It's worth conversation and some healthy debate. But at the heart of all five of these things, the church is committed to, the Bible is committed to these things. And yet we're forced into a situation where we have to choose. And some of you might be like, I don't feel forced, I'm I'm good. But, But I know there are many of us here that feel that pressure and maybe have conformed to say, I only like a couple of these because the group I'm in only likes a couple of these. 
And the danger in that, and these are just some of the issues, is that you might be reflecting only part of God's heart and you might even be at a point where you're passionately opposing one of these things that God actually really cares about. I'll mention another one. I know this is a hot topic and I'm not gonna tell you (laughs) policies or how to vote, but it's something I hear Christians talk about often um, that oftentimes makes me cringe and makes me sad. And it's when we talk about immigration. Uh, Immigration is one of those things that's a hot topic and it has been for a long time. Both sides have not found a solution they can all agree on. It's complicated. Not my place to tell you exactly what to do, but I will tell you the way the scripture talks about how God's people should look at people in that situation, whether they're legal or illegal immigrants. Again, not talking about policy, but talking about people as human beings and what kind of thoughts we should have and things we should say about people in that situation. So all the way back in the Old Testament, God's talking about this because all of a sudden Israel has their own land and they gotta decide what are we gonna do when there's people in our land uh, that aren't native? And we don't really know how they got there. They... Obviously, God's writing this because Israel's not treating immigrants very well, so he has to write this. This is what God says, Leviticus 19, 9 through 10, and then another text. When you reap the harvest of your land, you are not to reap to the very edge of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Don't strip your vineyard bare or gather its fallen grapes, but leave them for the poor and the resident alien. So don't be stingy. Don't go grab everything that's yours Leave some. I'm commanding you to leave the edges for those who have less. Why? I am the Lord, your God. Later in that chapter, it says, when an alien, someone who's an outsider, a foreigner, resides with you in your land, you must not oppress him. You will regard the alien who resides with you as a native born among you. You are to love him as yourself. Why? For you were aliens in the land of Egypt. And again, I am the Lord your God. You're not God. You don't get to decide what's, what you're gonna do. I'm the Lord your God. I created these people. I want you to care for them. I want you to see them as your neighbor. So again, you can debate all day on policy and what works best, but the heart of God towards people who are coming from the outside, who don't belong, who are immigrants, should reflect something like this. So while what you do is debatable at the border, what's not debatable is how Christians think and speak about immigrants, both legal and illegal. As Christians, yeah, you can say, I I want you to do it a legal way, but I'm gonna love you. I'm gonna speak fairly of you. I'm gonna honor you as a human being. But again, because that issue is so politically charged, Christians will say all kinds of things and, and feel all kinds of things towards these people that God looks at and says like, These are my kids. I love them and I want you to view them in a particular way, the way that I view them. But when it's this whole uh, idea you have to hold on to everything, for some of us in the political sphere, we, we just end up parroting something else that doesn't reflect God's whole heart. So I wanna bring this back. Uh, not, there's no one political party that contains all of God's whole heart and it's possible that it very well may contradict God's heart at times. And so one of the dangers is if we get so caught up in politics and so caught up in a party's system and talking points, we might find ourselves standing opposed to God. And if you're a disciple of Jesus, that's not something that you want. And while we might brush it off, well, yeah, that's just politics though. It's the way we're living and we're acting. It's the way that we're thinking. And our worship is not unaffected by those things. So politics, if it's creating attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs that are not being renewed by God, it might be affecting the worship that we offer. Not just our witness, not just the influence we have, but our own worship with God. Now, that is challenging, depressing, hard to hear. There there might be a question now, like, so what do I do then so I can worship God in a way that pleases him? And that's point two. Paul's clear, I think. It's our worship is pleasing to God when we are aligned with God's heart. And this is why we're talking about this, right? When we're aligned with God's whole heart, we're offering worship to him that pleases him. And I recognize that we're all sinful people who are in process and on our way, and there's always places for us to grow until we die. But that's not a good reason to not still chase after God's whole heart, to make that our aim, to make that the thing that we're striving for. 